So the one for me when I read it, one of the things um, I knew I knew that Asperger's syndrome was named after a guy right. named Asperger, um, but I really didn't know anything further. And so that was that whole chunk about Hans Asperger's work and, right. and what he was doing was was really amazing to me. And that, and and you kind of point out how that story got kind of lost to the to yes. especially Americans. Right. Um, and really all the non-German readers. Right, right, yeah. Yeah, well, here's the thing. Um, Asperger was working for Nazis. Mm -hmm. And he was working for Nazis in the run-up to the Holocaust. And um, before the Nazis marched into Austria to annex the country for the German father, Austro-German fatherland in 1938, Asperger and his colleagues had a very beautiful thing going at the University of Vienna. It was a clinic that was also a school, that was also a place to live. Um, they had stuff like music and dancing. Asperger would read poetry to the children. Um, they had special furniture that was nice. Like It was designed to be a very comfortable place where the kids could learn how to relate to other people and find their own way in life, which was not... Um, to, they didn't have a, an idea of normality inflicted upon them. In fact, one of the real treasures that I found for the book was an American psychiatrist went to visit the clinic in like 1935. And at first he was not convinced by what was going on there because he said that they seemed to have no theoretical foundation. Like everybody was like getting into psychoanalysis, like where's the grand theory that's guiding all this work? They're like, we just look at the kids and, you know, we watch what they do and we watch what they have trouble with and we watch what they're good at. We try to, you know, help them find more ways to do the stuff they like. We listen to them. Like one of the things that Asperger said was that he learned a lot about designing an educational program for autistic kids by listening to the autistic kids who he was trying to educate. So instead of seeing the kids in the clinic as sick, or, you know, like uh, having a mental illness or whatever. Like, um, he saw them as people who were having problems in life and if they could create sort of a microcosm of humane society in this clinic, then it would be good for the kids, it would be good for the staff. Yeah, but then the Nazis marched in and everything changed. And, um, you know, I don't want to spoil or upset, you know, but... Heavy stuff happened, as you might imagine. And um, the reason why I wrote so much about Asperger's Clinic was because there's a little secret about Asperger's Clinic that, well, there are a million books about Asperger's Syndrome, but basically every description of Asperger's Clinic was based on the same three paragraphs written by Uta Frith uh, in like the 80s. They were, they were really good paragraphs, but Nobody knew anything more. It's like almost everybody copied those paragraphs more or less. So it's like I really wanted to find out more. So I became utterly obsessed with finding out more about Asperger's Clinic. I eventually got the floor plan. I got a, a copy of the daily schedule, which was really amazing. Um, I had translated stuff from the German, um, including stuff from later stuff that Asperger wrote. I discovered that the very first public talk on autism in history was in 1938 to an audience of Nazis um, by Hans Asperger. Um, so I had, I had that translated as well. And it turns out that what Asperger was trying to put over with, to this audience of Nazis was what we would now call neurodiversity, which he was saying that the gifts of these children are inextricable from the challenges that they face. That it's not like, oh, all we have to do is eliminate the challenges you know, and then the gifts will still be... He didn't see that. He saw the children as organic wholes, basically. And he also understood that, by the way, autistic children grow up to become autistic adults because he followed them for a long time. And Leo Connor, whose definition of autism prevailed for most of the 20th century, did not even think about autistic teenagers and adults until way later in his career, like 30 years after he um, published his paper. So I began to feel that Asperger really had the spectrum right, mm -hmm. had autism as a lifelong condition right, and also had some really good ideas about education. And So yeah. kind of the, the breadth of, of different kinds of clients that he would see was, is kind of what we would see as now as a modern 
the modern spectrum. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And it's not to say that, you know, it's like one of the urban myths of autism that is so common, like most people you know probably still believe this is true. What people say is, Leo Connor saw 11 low-functioning kids, and Hans Asperger only saw four high-functioning kids. That is not true. Um, Asperger saw 200 kids at all levels of ability, from kids who pro would need help with daily life every day of their lives to w one of his former patients became an astronomy professor. So he saw the whole range of the spectrum. Mm -hmm. I don't know why everyone skips over that footnote in his paper. It says it in the paper, 200, you know? And that's like plus adults that he saw as well. And unlike Connor, Asperger felt that autism was common and that once you saw it, you would, once you learned how to recognize it, you would see it everywhere. And boy, is that ever true. I have to say, it's like one of the things that's really changed. It's like, you know, when I started in 2000, I was like, Autism is rare. You know, it's like now, oh my God, you know. And I think back to, and it's not like now, oh my God, there's so many more autistic people than there used to be. It's like now I think back to friends of mine uh, in high school. Mm -hmm. And yeah, there was a guy who like never really left his room, but at least he invited me into it, you know. And there, there were other people that I knew from my past who were almost certainly on the spectrum. So... So Connor, so if this was vaudeville, Connor, we'd all be hissing right now. Well, we would, but <laughs> I, I, I mean, here's the thing. My book is not binary about good and evil. And that's because everybody in the book is really complicated. Yeah. So Connor, you know, yes, he blamed mothers, which was, or not just mothers, parents. He blamed so-called refrigerator parenting for causing autism. Boy, was that ever a bad idea. You know, that was one of the worst ideas in autism history because it put families through misery. It made institutionalization the recommended course of treatment uh, for autism. It added a burden of guilt and shame to the challenges of raising a child on the spectrum. Um, how awful. Yet at the same time, Connor rescued hundreds of Jewish clinicians from the Nazis, including, by the way, and this is like the big scoop in my book, for autism heads is um, that Connor rescued Asperger's chief diagnostician, George Frankel. And so up until the publication of my book, mm -hmm. everybody has thought that the discoveries of autism in 1943 and 1944 by Hans Asperger and Leo Connor, that that was a, one of the biggest coincidences of 20th century medicine. No, no, no. In fact, Connor had two of Asperger's core team with him in Baltimore when he quote unquote discovered autism. Mm 